Dashing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh. O'er the fields we go, laughing all the way. Jingle bells, jing, jing bells, jingle all the way. Bells and bobtails ring, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing the sleighing song tonight. Jingle bells, jingle bells. Merry Christmas. Glad you're here today. We are um, celebrating Jesus' birth, and we are on, kind of looking at the songs that accompanied the first birth a long time ago. And today we're looking at probably the most famous birth announcement in the history of the world. And, uh, you know, when we were having kids, a birth announcement was essentially you sent out a postcard in the mail to all your friends and told people you were having a child. And people have been much more uh, creative in the last, you know, several years about giving birth announcements. So I was looking online and I found a few. I thought I'd just uh, share a couple with you. On, on here's one birth announcement, right? It's a way to what tell people. Here's another one I saw that I thought was kind of interesting. If you're an '80s person, you'll get the '80s reference. Yeah, ice, ice, baby, right? Uh, and then there's this one I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, kind of cute. This one here. If you're <laughs> If you're a techie person, right, you might like that one. Uh, and then I thought this one was probably the most uh, realistic. I know, it is sad, right? But it's true, right? I mean, so as, as today as we're looking at the angel song, God decided to announce the birth of his son with angels. And not just one angel. One angel starts talking in the story. But then a host of angels show up and start singing about the birth of Christ. I mean, what an amazing birth announcement, the sky filled with angels. And I think sometimes, you know, when we're picturing angels, we don't picture the biblical angels because in the Bible, the angels were warriors. I mean, the first thing the angels say when they show up to anybody is don't be afraid because the person is terrified. And, um, but I think what we've done is we've kind of reduced angels to being like cupids wearing diapers with bow and arrows, right? I mean, but that's not the biblical view of angels. Angels are God's warriors, and they would show up to do God's work and do battle with, you know, demons and all this other kind of stuff. So angels were very fearsome back in the, uh, in the Bible, and we believe even till today. And unfortunately, we've kind of reduced some of these spiritual things to baby cupids for angels and, you know, devils that have, you know, a pitchfork and are red and have pointed ears and stuff, um, which really isn't based on reality. But so today, I just kind of want you to think about the story as we walk through it, and we're going to pull out a couple things out of the story. But we're talking about the angel song, and the angel song really kind of answers the question, how did God come? How did God come to us? So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 2. Uh, if you have a phone, you can open up your Bible app and go to the notes for today. You can find them under the events in your YouVersion app. But we'll kind of walk down through this scripture, and then we'll try to pull it apart a little bit. So starting in Luke chapter 2, Luke was um, actually, Luke did not uh, know Jesus, Luke was um, somebody who knew Jesus secondhand, but when Luke wrote his book and he wrote the Gospel of Luke, he decided he was, he was a doctor, he was actually a physician, um, so he had some education behind him, and he decided he was going to write a thorough account of the Gospel of Jesus. And so he basically interviewed anybody who had known Jesus, and he wrote Luke based on all these eyewitness accounts. And so here's what he writes in Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were, what were they? Terrified, right? Because they've never seen anything like this. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. 
suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, as you read through that, to many of you, that's probably very familiar to hear that a story. Um, if you ever watched the Christmas Peanuts special, you know, Linus, this is the script that Linus reads. Um, but this is probably the most famous biblical passage for Jesus' birth, right? The angels showing up to the shepherds. And it's interesting because, you know, a few things in here just to pull out. It's interesting. So that they say, um, today in the town of David, uh, a Savior has been born to you. So a Savior is somebody who saves you. And then the angel says this very important key word, Messiah. Now, the Jewish people had been waiting for somebody, a Savior, a, an amazing spiritual person to show up into their time to free them from the tyranny that they were under. And so they were looking for this Messiah for, for thousands of years. And so when they hear the word Messiah, and it's coming from an angelic being floating in the air, right? They're going, this must be true. And so they are going, wow, like we're going to have to check this out. And then all of a sudden, the, the uh, heavenly host shows up, which is probably hundreds of thousands of angels in the sky. Um, this was a huge, huge display of God's glory to bring his son into the world. But the first thing we want to look at is this, is that he says, you're going to find this Messiah in the palace, reigning over the entire earth. Right? No. He says, this is the odd thing, right? You're going to find this Messiah, and here's the sign. It's going to be a baby lying in a manger, which is an animal's food trough. And that's where you're going to find him. And he's going to be wrapped in cloths. And so the shepherds go and try to find the sign. But the interesting thing is that as the angels are telling about God coming into this world, they're saying, this God, this Messiah, this Jesus is going to be human. It's not going to be like a glowing person or a glowing being walking around the earth. This is going to be a person. And so today, that's kind of the first thing we're looking at as we pull out of this passage is this. Jesus was fully human. Now, there's a couple problems with Jesus being fully human. The first problem is because if people don't believe in God, they don't believe in Jesus, um, they, that's just, this is exactly what they believe. Jesus was fully human, and that's it. He was not the Son of God. He was just a man who came, you know, who was born and, and raised, and people got the wrong idea, and they lifted him up higher than they should have, and he deceived all these people, and now all these people have been deceived for thousands of years, right? So people who don't believe in Jesus, they would say that, you know, Jesus is just a person. But there's also a problem with people in the church, because if you grew up in the church thinking that Jesus is God, then I think sometimes that separates us from Jesus, because we think, well, if Jesus is God, he doesn't understand me. I mean, Jesus is perfect. He never sinned. So how can Jesus really understand me and my problems? How does Jesus understand the relationship difficulty I'm going through right now? How does Jesus actually understand the job loss that I'm working with or the, the problem I'm having with my kids or the problem I'm having with my parents? Or how does Jesus really, under, does he really understand? He was God. Could he really empathize with my position? And the problem for people who don't believe in Jesus is they say, Jesus was just a man. He can't help me. Why would I go to Jesus for help? He was just a person. And so as we pull apart these two different viewpoints, I, I want you to understand at least what the Bible says about Jesus. So here's what the Bible says. It's very clear. Jesus was 100% human and 100% God at the same time. And I know what you're thinking, right? Some of you are thinking, well, that can't be because that would be 200%, right? Like that doesn't work out. Like it can't be fully something and fully something else. But this is something that theologians would call the incarnation. The incarnation means that God was fully God and fully human at the same time. How do we explain that? We, we can't explain it. It's, it's supernatural, but that's why during Christmas we sing songs like we did this morning, like Emmanuel. And Emmanuel literally means God with us. Now, as we, as we kind of dig in this a little bit, we, go, we can look at the book of John, and John doesn't talk about the Christmas story as we think of it with wise men and shepherds. But John does allude to who Jesus is. And so in John chapter 1, the first verses, he comes out of the gate saying this. In the beginning was the Word. And when he's saying the Word, he's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word, what's it say? The Word what? 
was God. He, Jesus, was with God. When was he with God? In the beginning. So this is the first thing to understand about Jesus and what we believe is that Jesus did not come into being when Mary bore him into this world. That was not Jesus' first foray into the universe. Jesus existed from the very beginning. In fact, John is saying in this passage that he was with God in the beginning, and then it even goes further than that. Through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus is the creator of this world. So that makes it a little bit different when you think about Christmas, because I think that what that does, at least for me, and maybe it does for you, but you think about God had to actually, you know, who may, maybe God was sitting on his throne, and God had to say this, I live in majesty, I live in power, I live in omnipotence, I, there's no one greater than me, but I'm going to go down to this earth that I made, and I'm going to live as one of them. I'm going to be born into the world, and I'm going to be raised like one of them. And so he steps off his throne, and he allows himself to be born to this poor couple in Bethlehem. And he grows up, and he lives his life, and he actually sacrifices himself for his people. But that's the interesting thing about this, right? That God was, God was Jesus, and Jesus was there before time even began, and Jesus allowed himself to be put into this world and to live as a human being in this world. It's, it's kind of crazy, right? And this is interesting because the, the very first words, in the beginning... What's that remind you of? The very first words in Genesis, right? It goes back all the way to Genesis. In the beginning, and he's pulling back from this Genesis reference and saying, in the beginning was the word. Jesus was there in the very beginning. So let's skip to verse 14. Here's what John says in 14, and this is the critical verse for Christmas as far as John is concerned and what he has to say about Christmas. But John says this in verse 14. The word, what did the word do? Became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus came down from his throne in heaven and becomes flesh and blood and is born into this world. The Message Bible says it in this way, which I like. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, right? (laughs) Jesus was living among the people and, and it, you know, and it kind of gives us idea, right? Jesus was living, God was walking among us and some people recognized him. And some people didn't recognize him. But the people who saw him and were touched by him, their life was never the same again. It was different for the rest, it was different for the rest of their lives. And it's not just John that talks about this, God being human. Um, in, the author, uh, in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews writes this, for this, reason, the, for this reason, he, which is Jesus, had to be made like them, like us. Fully human in how many ways? In every way. In order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. The author of Hebrews is saying this, Jesus became a person so that we could never say to God, you don't understand me. You don't understand my life, God. You're way up there in the heavens. You don't understand who I am. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand the pain. You don't understand the memories. You don't understand the baggage I have. Jesus goes, yes, I do. Because I walked in your shoes. He came to earth to live the same life that we live. The Apostle Paul also echoes this idea in Philippians. He says this, Christ, who being in very nature, who? God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself what? Nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in what? Human likeness. So this is not just one author of the Bible. This is several authors of the Bible all saying, Jesus was not just a man. Jesus was God. And if we go back to Hebrews for a minute, in uh, chapter 2, verse 18, the author of Hebrews says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to what? Help those who are being tempted. Because he himself suffered. He can identify with your pain. He can identify with the struggles that you go through because he himself went through those things. In chapter 4, the author of Hebrews writes, he has been tempted in every way, just as what? Just as we are. Yet, he did not sin. This is what sets Jesus apart. He didn't sin. So, I guess you could say this. Our God understands what it's like to be human. I don't know if another God can do that. 
You can research all the other religions of the world, but how many other religions have a God who came into this world and lived as a human so they would know exactly what we're going through? Only one. It's Jesus. Jesus lived life as a human being. As you read through the scriptures, you read he was born as a baby. He experienced pain and rejection when people spat in his face and put him on the cross. He was betrayed by people he loved, just like us, just like we're betrayed by people we love. He wept when his best friend died. We weep when people die around us. He got angry. He actually gets so angry one time in the temple that he, he kicks over tables and he makes a whip and he starts destroying things. Why? Because he was burning with anger. You ever gotten angry? Right? Jesus has been there. He even had a prayer denied by God. Have you ever had a prayer, a prayer denied by God? You ever pray to God and say, God, where are you? That's what Jesus did. He's on the cross and he prays, God, take this cup from me. And what's God say? No. You need to go through with it. And sometimes God, we feel like, doesn't hear our prayers or he says no to things that we want. Jesus understands. Jesus knows what the human experience is like because he lived it. This is the God that we serve. So why does the incarnation matter? The incarnation matters for a couple reasons. I'd say this. The first is because Jesus was fully human, he understands you. But even better, because he is God, he can help you. And that's something that no other God can do. So the first thing is this. God came into this world as flesh and blood, lived here on the earth, just like we do. And the second thing I would say is this from this verse. Jesus brings peace. And we hear this all through the Christmas story, right? Jesus brings peace. Peace on earth. And maybe you, as you look around this earth, go, <laughs> not seeing much peace. We see shootings, and we see terrorism, and we see people dying, and we see horrible things. How can we find peace on earth. But we read, we just read, right, in Luke chapter 2, glory to God in the highest in heaven and on earth, peace. But then we have to read the rest. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. What does that mean? All right. Peace to those on whom God's favor. How can you get God's favor to rest on you? And this version may not be the best version to help us understand this. If you look to another version, the English Standard Version of the Bible is translated like this, peace among those with whom he is pleased. That makes a little more sense, right? It's saying that people who have peace are people that God is pleased with. The Message Bible is probably the most plainly written one, right? And in the Message Bible, it says this, peace to all men and women on earth who what? Please him. So peace is not available at, to everyone. Peace will not be offered to everyone until each person decides to start pleasing God. When you start pleasing God, peace will start to enter your life. The author of this series that we're going through called Christmas Playlist, Alistair Begg, writes this. The peace of God that invades a life is based on the discovery of peace with God. And that makes a huge difference. The peace of God that invades a life is based on the discovery of peace with God. So in other words, when you make peace with God, you start finding the peace of God. But if you don't have peace with God, then you never have peace of God. Does that make sense? So this whole idea of peace is maybe, maybe not necessarily how you're thinking of it. Like peace on earth is going to mean all the wars will stop and all the natural disasters will stop and everybody's going to be nice to each other, and we're just going to live politely and nicely, and nobody's going to ever have an issue again. Peace on earth is talking about the peace that comes from the peace that God gives you in your heart to live with the people around you, and you will start to discover peace. You know, as um, kids, I remember a scene that happened over and over and over in my house. And if you had siblings, how many people here had, grew up with siblings? You may have experienced this. We had these things on our couch um, that hung over the back of the couch. They're called Afghans. Does anybody remember an Afghan? For those of you who don't know, it's a blanket made out of yarn, right? And, um, you know, you'd be, you, ants would make these for children and give them to them for Christmas, right? These Af Afghans, right? And so we had Afghans on our couch. 
And um, when you were watching TV, of course, if you were the only one down there, you would spread out on the couch. And then a sibling would come down, and they'd want to sit on the couch. Is anybody identifying with this at all yet, right? They would want to sit on the couch, and they'd go to sit on the couch, and you might move your feet a tiny bit, right? You might be able to squeeze into the very end by my feet. But then the person would squeeze in, and they'd start, like, pushing on your feet. And then what do you start doing? Kicking, right? Yes. You kick them off the couch. And then there becomes a big squabble until mom and dad come in, and they have to break up the fight. But the problem is, is that when we want to be comfortable, we don't want to make room for anybody else. It doesn't get that much better when you get older. It really doesn't. When you're comfortable and somebody else needs room, I mean, you watch on buses, right, and on subways, when people sit down, they'll sit down, right? They'll sit down wide, kind of, and they'll put a bag here and their hand here, you know, because they're not going to make room for anybody. I mean, a little lady could come sit, like, come stand right in front of them holding onto the pole, and the person will still just sit there, right? Because who is this life about? Me. I was here first. I got these three seats all to myself, right? Because we're not willing to make room. Why did Jesus end up in a stable? Because there was no room. No one made room for Jesus. Think of the irony. Jesus made the world. Jesus came into the world, and there wasn't a place for him in the world he created. Bizarre, right? Why is that? Why didn't Jesus carve out a better place for himself? Jesus could have had the innkeeper have room. Oh, yes, we have one last room. It's in the penthouse on top. It's amazing. It just happens to be empty. Come on in, Mary and Joseph, right? Could Jesus not have done that? Of course he could have. But the innkeeper says, nope, no room. And Jesus is born in an animal's feeding trough. Because no one would make room for him. Let's be honest. Just like kids not letting anyone else on the couch, Some of us just haven't made room in our lives for Jesus. Why? It's too inconvenient. If I surrender my life to Jesus, I'm going to have to start living like this. If I truly surrender my life to Jesus, I'm going to have to start giving, you know, giving generously to the church and to other places. If I surrender my life to Jesus, I may have to treat other people in this way. If I surrender my life to Jesus, I may have to change the way that I spend my money. If I surrender my life to Jesus, I may have to allow other people room that is my room. It's my space. I don't want to invite other people into my space. And so we hoard the room we have. Too inconvenient, too uncomfortable, it's too hard. It is. Jesus said there's two roads that you have in front of you. There's the wide road that leads to destruction, and many are on it. And then there's the narrow road that goes to the right, or to the left, and it's difficult. It's a difficult, narrow road with rocks in the way and all kinds of stuff. And he says it, but few find it. That's the road of life. Is there room in your life for Jesus? Or will you turn him away like the innkeeper did? Have you made peace with God? Maybe today's the day. Because you realize that peace with God means that you will finally have the peace of God. Do you have peace today? Do you sit sit in your chairs, you hear these words and go, Lord, thank you so much. I am at peace. Or do you feel like my life is a wreck? I need something to happen. I need something to change. There are things in my life that are not going the way I planned, God, and I need your help to get in the right direction. The angel song is about how God came. He came as a human who experienced life in our shoes. And he came to bring peace to those who live to please God. Are you living to please God? You can have peace in your life today. You just have to make peace with God by making room for Jesus in your life. Who ironically is the prince of what? Peace. Maybe it's your day. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your your word. We thank you for the story that we can read about how you came into this world. And God, we find it amazing that you would make room for yourself 
and make room for all of us by coming to this earth, that you would inconvenience yourself and you would condescend to our level so that we can have a relationship with you. Father, today we just think about the angels in that birth announcement and how they promised peace. And Father, maybe some of us don't have peace today. I just want to pray for anybody here. If you feel like you need to make a change in your relationship with God, whether it's a commitment or a recommitment to Jesus, and you feel like today's the day I need to make a change because my life is not what I want it. I need to make a difference. And God, I want you to do it. I just want you to raise your hand and I'll pray for you. If anybody here says, I want to make that change in my life today, just raise your hand. Yep, thanks in the back. Yep, thanks over here in the middle. Anybody else? Lord, thank you for each person that rose, raised their hand. We just pray, God, that as they start to look to you, and as they start to live for you, Lord, that you would allow them to sense your peace in their life, even amongst the busyness of the season and maybe family things that will come up in the next few weeks as we get together at parties and gatherings. God, we pray that you would just continue to dole out your peace to these individuals in a way that they've never experienced before because they are embracing what Jesus did on the cross. The rest of us, God, we just do pray that you continue to show us who you are this Christmas season, that we wouldn't just see a cute baby in a manger, but we would realize that, Jesus, you came to save people from their sin, and you'd ultimately end up on the cross and ultimately end up coming back from the grave so that we can be reunited with you. And we pray, Lord, that that would be in our hearts this season. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen.